Hi, everyone. Uh, it's good to see you all. I've uh, given a number of talks in person at Nueva, and so it's kind of good to be back. It's even um, just uh, not in person, but virtually. Um, oh. So today, um, I thought I would just uh, talk a little bit about dolphin brains and intelligence and uh, see if you have any questions, um, just to kind of whet your appetite about what, the, what dolphin brains are like. I've been studying them for over 30 years. I'm a neuroscientist and I've studied dolphin and whale brains from stranded animals um, and I've done a lot of imaging studies, a lot of studies in terms of their brain size and uh, some studies uh, on their cognition. So I think um, I will just uh, begin by sharing my screen and then uh, if there are questions afterwards, we can, we can have a chat. So let me do that. Um, so, okay, let's get started then. Um, Again, as I mentioned, I've been studying brains and intelligence in dolphins and whales for over 30 years. And I'm gonna tell you a little bit about um, what is so fascinating about them. Um, and the first question I really wanna start with is who are dolphins? So, Dolphins are actually uh, one family in a whole order of mammals uh, called cetaceans. And there's actually two suborders, the odontocetes or toothed dolphins and whales and the mysticetes, the big rorqual whales. And there are a lot of species, about 76 different species of odontocetes and 14 Mysticetes. So when we talk about dolphins and whales and porpoises, we have to say, who are we talking about? Which family? There are six families uh, in the subwater odontocete. And when we talk about dolphins, we're pretty much talking about the, num the species who are in this, this family called the delphinids. So if we go to the delphinid family, and we're talking about dolphins, there are actually 38 different species in the family of dolphins. And there's really only a few that we know a lot about. Bottomless dolphin, the common dolphin, um, and a few others. But take a look at the variety of dolphins that exist um, just within that one of six families within that suborder of Odonocetes. And the story that we're able to tell about dolphins and whales is one that I was very happy to participate in. Many years ago, I did a study to look at what it is about dolphins that actually made them so brainy. And when did they get their big brains? And it, it actually turns out that the, the shift, the time when dolphins actually started to become dolphins was about 30 to 35 million years ago. And there was some change in the ocean temperature, prey availability, and it required a shift in adaptations. And they went from being animals that look like what you see on the left to animals that look like what you see on the right. The animals on the left were large. They weren't very large brained and they had big formidable teeth. And after 30, 35 million years ago, these animals went on, uh, started an evolutionary uh, track to becoming bigger brained, having smaller teeth, and being more social. And at that time, they started to echolocate. So something happened that required a big shift in how they looked and how they acted and in their brains around 30, 35 million years ago. 
So what are cetacean brains like? Well, they are extremely large, extremely complex. Um, and I'm gonna walk you through some of the differences and similarities between our brains and those of some dolphins and whales. So if you look on the right, you see the human brain. And we have a, a brain that's very, very wrinkled on the surface. And that surface is called the neocortex. And the surface, the wrinkles on the surface tell you something about how much tissue is there, how much neocortical tissue has been packed into that cranium. And in fact, we have very large brains for our body size. Our brains are about seven times larger than you would expect for a typical animal of our body size. Now, if you go to the left and you look at the orca or killer whale brain, this is a brain that is much, much larger than ours. And it is about two and a half times larger than you'd expect even for the largest body size of an orca. But what's interesting about this brain is that it is more, it is the most gyrified and neocorticalized brain on the planet. And I'll tell you what that means. So if you look at the surface of that brain, you see that there are many, many more wrinkles on the surface. So it actually, their neocortex has more surface area than our brain. And we could talk about what that could or could not mean. But what's also interesting is that in the orca, we find that the part of the brain, the, the, the relationship, the size of the neocortex to the rest of the brain is even higher than it is in humans. That makes the orca brain the most neocorticalized brain on the planet. So in other words, comparing the orca brain and the human brain, and comparing the neocortex to the rest of the brain, the neocortex in the orca brain is larger to the size of their brain. And what does that mean? Well, we know that the neocortex is doing all kinds of fancy cognitive stuff, right? It's involved with abstract thinking, problem solving, self-awareness, uh, sensory processing, all kinds of things. So in fact, the orca brain is actually a brain that looks like um, it actually is set up more for advanced cognitive thinking than even the human brain. And again, on the left, you see another brain. It's a beluga whale brain. And this one too is very large. And it's also more wrinkled or more gyrified than the human brain. So this is really interesting because the question is, what does this all mean? It turns out that if you look across a number of species, you find several who have brains that are three to five times larger than you'd expect. So that means that they are swimming around with tremendous brains for their body size, three, four, five times the size. Just like we are walking around with brains that are about seven times the size. And again, the question is why? Now there's also um, some really interesting aspects of dolphin brains that are really different than the human brain. For instance, Human brains process auditory and visual information in two different parts of the brain, as you see on the left. But we found in a study we did in 2015, something very interesting. We knew that the visual and auditory information comes into the dolphin brain in a different place, but we found a second auditory region in their brain. So they have two areas that process sound and we have one. And we think that this is because they have echolocation and they're actually processing their whistles 
and other sounds in one part of the brain and their echolocation in another part of the brain. So dolphins and whales have extremely large brains. They're very complex. And in many ways, they have characteristics that even excel those of the human brain. So what do we know about the intelligence of dolphins and whales? Well, over 20 years ago now, I did a study of two dolphins who uh, were living in a marine park in Coney Island, Brooklyn. And my co-author, Diana Reese and I decided that we wanted to see whether or not dolphins could recognize themselves in mirrors. And we thought this was important because we knew that humans recognize themselves, obviously, and chimpanzees do, but no other animal had yet shown the ability to recognize themselves in mirrors. And we thought, well, why is that important? It seems like such a simple thing, but actually it indicates that you have a sense of self, a sense of awareness. When you look in the mirror in the morning, you say, that's me in the mirror. And then you use the mirror to comb your hair, wash your face and groom yourself. And so that capacity is something that has been shown in chimpanzees and other great apes and elephants and in magpies. But 20 years ago, um, we didn't know if dolphins could recognize themselves. So we did a study that showed that, yes, they are able to recognize themselves in mirrors. On the right, you see a photo of one of the dolphins who has a mark on the side of his head, and he's using the mirror, you can see his reflection, to check out the mark on his head. On the left, is a different dolphin and he is using a reflective surface to check out a mark that we pretended to put under his fin. So those, uh, those two dolphins independently were able to show that when we put different marks on them or we pretended to put a mark on them, that we could actually, they actually went to a mirror to check out the mark, just like we would if we woke up one day and we had a pimple in the middle of our face, we would use the mirror to check it out. And that's exactly what they do. They posture in front of the mirror to, to expose the mark area. And this shows unequivocally that they are, they have a level of self-awareness not unlike our own. Now, a lot of what we know about dolphins and whales comes from studies in captivity, but now, now most of what we're learning really comes from field studies in the wild. Um, and the things that we're learning about them are really remarkable because it, it tells us that they have some very, very complex and strong emotions and social bonds. Um, these societies of dolphins and whales are held together by strong emotional ties, just like in our societies. And the mother-child relationship is exceptionally strong. We also know that they come to the aid of each other if one is sick or can't, can't uh, swim, sometimes other members of the pod will come and hold them up so that they can breathe or come and bring them food. And when one dies in a pod, they often show grieving behaviors. For instance, if a mother gives birth to a calf who then passes away, she will sometimes carry that calf on her back for many days before letting that calf go. So they show behaviors that indicate that they have strong emotional ties and have an understanding of something that we thought was unique to humans, but we know now is not, and that's empathy and compassion. And they also 
have cultural traditions, which is really fascinating because years ago, uh, before you guys were born, if you were in school and you mentioned culture and other animals, people would laugh at you. But now we know many other species have cultures, meaning learned behaviors passed on across generations and differing from one group to another. So just as different human cultures have different ways of doing things, different dolphin and whale cultures have different ways of doing things and that's passed on by learning, social learning. For instance, they have different dialects just like we do. They use different tools they hunt and prey and, and choose prey in different ways. On the left, you see orcas who are living off the coast of North of New Zealand and they eat stingrays. And you see a stingray in his mouth and they are very delicately can remove the sting from the stingray and then eat the stingray. But if you go to another part of the world the orca community there may eat only mammals. And yet in another part of the world, the orca community there will only eat salmon. This is part of their cultural traditions that they pass on from one generation to the next. On the right, you see a bottlenose dolphin who's carrying something peculiar on his rostrum. And what he's carrying is a sponge. And that's a sponge that this particular group of dolphins off Australia, they carry these sponges around so that they can root around in the sand for prey, for fish, and not scratch their rostrum up on the bottom. So one female adopted this. She uses the sponge like a glove, and she passed this on to her daughter. And now there are many spongers in this community. Not everyone sponges, but some of them sponge. And that's a culture that they've developed all on their own and is passed on from mother to child. So now I want to end by showing you um, a YouTube video that gives you an idea of how intelligent dolphins are by showing you a very complex hunting strategy that they engage in. So I'm going to play this for you and then we can, we can chat. When you're smart and you know what your neighbor's thinking, you can develop ever more effective strategies to outwit your prey. Key to a dolphin's ability to strategize is this incredible brain. And scientists are now beginning to work out where its processing power is focused. The cerebellum is highly developed. It's thought to be involved in the complex tasks of echolocation and moving in a three-dimensional world. And the cerebral cortex used for planning and higher order thinking is 40% more folded than our own. It's thought that this complexity helps a dolphin hunt cooperatively. But to power this big brain, takes up to 20% of a dolphin's metabolic energy. So a reliable, high-calorie diet is important. The shallow, murky waters of Florida Bay are a difficult place to live. The fish that live here are fast and manoeuvrable and there's no obvious way to corner them. But these particular dolphins are not your average hunters. 
even in murky water, their echolocation can detect a target shoal from over 80 metres away. As they close in on the fish, one key role emerges. The chaser's job is to create an artificial barrier to stop the fish dead in their tracks. They conjure up a net made of mud. And the other members drive the fish into a dead end. In panic, the fish take to the air, straight into a trap. An innovative feeding strategy allows these particular dolphins to thrive in an area of the bay that no other can. Okay, thank you. That was really You're interesting. You're very welcome. You're very welcome. Let me um, see if I can uh, stop share and uh, see if anyone has any questions or wants to chat about anything. I actually have a quick question. Sure. So your last study was, I think, a few years ago, right? The one that you showed well, us today? The, the study on neurosoap recognition was done in 2001, yeah. yes. Yeah, so I was wondering if you've done any follow-ups to determine like the extent of their self-perception, I guess. Like, are they capable of more complex functions like, say, introspection or something like that? Yes, that's a really good question. So first of all, there is another research group that has done work with dolphins showing that they're capable of metacognition, which is a form of introspection, as you know. And they're able to think about what they know and how certain they are of what they know and use that information appropriately in an experiment. Mm -hmm. So yes, they also show other capacities that go along with self-awareness. Now, in terms mm -hmm. of this study, um, this study has been replicated, which is very important as you know in the sciences. Yeah. Um, but after I did the study, I began to learn several things about dolphins in captivity that made me question whether or not they should be in captivity. Mm -hmm. uh, those dolphins died at a young age. Mm -hmm. um, I began to realize that if they ought to wear their lives in a concrete tank, they're probably not great. And it and then I learned where they got dolphins from, um, the drive hunts and all of that came together. And, and I made the decision to not continue to do work with captive dolphins. And I just continued the work that I do with um, things, um, but that involves uh, other techniques, doesn't involve captive animals. And now I do a lot of work on their welfare and their well-being in captivity. Mm -hmm. So that was a choice I made. Okay. Uh, does anyone else have any questions? Um, I have one. Sure. Uh, hi. I'm just, hi. I'm curious how like you got into this field. Cause I feel like it's a very specific field that I didn't even know existed. And like, as a student, my two biggest interests are marine biology and psychology, and I did not know that there's a field that overlaps the two of them. So I guess I was just curious of like what led you to get into this field. Sure. Well, actually, there isn't a field. You kind of have to make it up. So I'm a neuroscientist by training. So I went to college. I studied the brain and behavior and how it's related to behavior. It's called biopsychology, psychobiology, neuroscience, whatever you want to call it. But I didn't go in to that wanting to be a marine biologist, study dolphins. 
I was more interested in other things. And the only reason that I started to study dolphins was because I happened to be in a library one day and I saw a dolphin brain in a book and I thought, wow. So as someone studying brains in general, I looked at that brain and I thought, wow, yeah, that's a, that's a brain that I could study. <laughs> and so that's how I got into it. So I'm not a marine biologist and I'm a neuroscientist who applied and, and a comparative psychologist. So you don't, so if you want to study brains and intelligence and dolphins and whales, um, there's many different ways to go, but doesn't necessarily mean you have to be a marine biologist. Got it. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you. Um, I think our club's block is over, so I think we're going to try and wrap up now, unless there are another question. If anyone has other questions, feel free to email me. Um, I'm more than happy to answer questions. Okay. Thank you so much. Thank you. Very Thank welcome. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.